Ecclesiastes chapter 8, we're at verse 10. And uh, we're going to be looking at a few verses this morning as we work our way through the book of Ecclesiastes, an incredible uh, book, uh, to say the least. And when you look at Ecclesiastes before the major prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so forth, you go before that. If you've gone back to Psalms, which I just turned to, you've gone too far, hang a right, it's in between the books I've just mentioned, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. And when you get there, well, you look at verse 10, and now keep in mind, over and over and over again, Solomon is dealing with contrasting the fallen, limited human perspective in looking at things under the sun from only an under the sun perspective. He uses that term under the sun over and over again with a bird's eye view from heaven, so to speak, a over the sun view. And sometimes he's contrasting it in such a way where you can tell he's been there and done that, and he was. You know, he even talks about this book, how he had, you know, he's the richest man on the planet (laughs) at the time. He had all kinds of money to get in all kinds of trouble. He... Uh, he allowed himself to get drunk when he fell away and was in apostasy. Uh, he allowed himself to worship false gods at one point. Uh, he had peacocks. He had all kinds of riches, everything that everybody else, like a circus, or, or I should say a zoo at his home, at his palace. Uh, people like, uh, you know, traveled for miles, you know, the Queen of Sheba, just to see him and, and, and hear his wisdom. He was the wisest man on the earth, but he misused that knowledge and wisdom God had given him and had fallen away and still had excelled. But he came to his senses, thank God. Amen? Got right with God. If he hadn't gotten right with God, we wouldn't really have this book. I don't think we'd have Proverbs either. Or God would use another man. We wouldn't have the Song of Songs. But the Lord said that he would discipline him with rods and put his fear in him, and he did, and brought him back. And so this becomes one of the most blessed books, I believe, in the canon of Scripture. Because how many have been having a good time going through Ecclesiastes? And how many of you acknowledge, yeah, sometimes it doesn't seem to make sense, but then when you look at it closer, it makes perfect sense all the way through. Amen? It's a trip. And I say that too, because when I was a newer Christian, and even after I've been, been a Christian for some time, sometimes I'd read passages in Ecclesiastes, I'd get cross-headed, like, Lord, what, what are you saying here, you know? And uh, this is the first time I've taken a fellowship through it verse by verse slowly. And I found prior to even going through it that any scripture you study and you really look at will, will make sense. And if it doesn't, you just put it on a hook and you say, Lord, you know, your ways are harder than my ways. Your thoughts are harder than my thoughts. I've got a pea brain compared to you. And eventually you're going to help me understand this. And it may even be in eternity when... Uh, you know, our shrouded insights uh, give way to the full light of God's truth, and we know as we're known, it says. But praise God, this book I found to be just incredible, and I love every, every verse in it. And now we're at verse 10, where Solomon says, So then, I have seen the wicked buried, those who used to go in and out from the holy place. Interesting contrast. They're the wicked. He sees them buried. He goes to their funerals. Those who used to go in and out from the holy place. Wow. And they are soon what? Forgotten in the city where they did this. This too is futility. He's saying these are men who were praised, basically. They were honored with lavish funerals, perhaps. And he saw these men. He's talking about going to a rich guy's, or not a rich guy, could be a rich guy in some cases, wicked guy's funeral and knowing he's wicked and seeing him have this wonderful funeral whereby he is praised and there's hypocrisy in it because he's gone in and out of the temple but he's lived a wicked life and people know the guy's wicked but he's going in and out of the temple and all of a sudden, he has a funeral, and everybody puts an explanation point on his life as though, or it seems that way, that he was a great guy. When he was a rip-off, he was a swindler and everything else. You know, it's interesting. What, what was Jesus' funeral like? What was his death like? The most humiliating death you could possibly 
imagine. Yet it becomes the most beautiful thing ever. Uh, Jack did a, a great job at the Passover yesterday, and I hope you guys can make it if we have one next year, because uh, you get to see the beauty of what Jesus did for us and how it was all part of God's divine plan. Amen? But this wasn't so beautiful. These funerals seem beautiful on the inside, but they're like Jesus talking about the wicked in their tombs and how outwardly they, they're, they're whitewashed, they're beautiful, they're, they, you know? They're ornate, but inwardly it's stinky, dead man's bones, you know. And that's how a lot of life is. I can't tell you how many funerals I've heard about. And believe me, I'm a pastor, so I know it's really tough on a pastor when you're doing a funeral of someone that doesn't have any evidence of having been saved. But you go to funerals uh, in most churches when even a wicked man perishes and a lot of times the pastor and everybody will talk about how they can't wait to see him in heaven and everything else. And, and we just ignore those verses that say, Be not deceived. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither fornicators and adulterers, homosexuals, and so forth. And they just, all of a sudden, it's like, it's like the pastor, everybody forgets what the Bible says during the funeral service. I can't tell you how many pa people have come to me lamenting that. And at the same time, I say, as a pastor, I see the difficulty when you have grieving loved ones who just lost their one of their best friends, their family member for years. But at the same time, pastors have an obligation to speak truth. Now, I'm not saying a pastor should go out and say, the, the dearly deceased is now burning in hell forever. You know, I mean, that would be like uncalled for too, you know. But it reminds me of the pastor who knew of a wicked man who died and he's doing the funeral and his brother who ran around town chasing women with him even though they were both married and and uh, ripping people off, beating people at times, even the homeless, really wicked man, came in and, and told the pastor that if uh, he made sure he didn't say anything bad about his brother, he'd give him 10,000 bucks. He says, but I'll be there in the front to make sure you don't speak any, any evil of him. Pastor wasn't really an honest pastor, but he wanted that 10,000 bucks. And he always praised the wicked at funerals anyway. And then he started talking at the funeral. The man was stunned. He goes, this man lived a deplorable, wicked life. He cheated on his wife. He, he drank to oblivion. He probably ripped half of you guys off in the church here. I'm not talking about the deceased. I'm talking about his brother. You know, so he got him back. But uh, anyway, uh, as a pastor... I don't want, I don't, personally, I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just an honest guy. I have a hard time. I don't like to do funerals of people who the evidence looks the other way. Sometimes you don't know where they were at the end of their lives. And if I do a funeral and I'm not sure, and it looks like they may not know the Lord, but maybe they came at the end, I don't know. I'll just talk about the person. I won't say, hey, they're in heaven right now. Praise the Lord. They, they knew Jesus, and uh, they love the Lord. I'm not going to lie, you know. And then I'll also... Also, give it to God in mystery at the end. I'll say, hey, you know, I prayed one time before a funeral where I, it was really difficult to do like that. I said, Lord, I'm not going to mislead people. I'm not going to act like this person's in heaven because I don't know. Maybe at the end of their lives they came to Jesus in their deathbed or whatever. I don't know. And I prayed and cried out to God. And the scripture that I believe he put on my heart was um, when Jesus in Luke 13, when they talked about the tower that fell down and, uh, and the blood that Pilate mingled there and the Galileans and what have you and they said were they you know they were asking the question you know and Jesus went to it were they more wicked than the rest of those you know because the tower fell upon them and what have you and Jesus said unless you repent you all likewise perish rather than talking about their destiny and speculating he mentioned that everybody needs to make sure they're right with God and that's exa and I thought, thank you Jesus and that's what I did I said hey you know I'm not sure where this person was at exactly but we need to make sure that we're right with God before we die. Amen? And, uh, and being a straightforward, truth-speaking, in-love pastor on a lot of doctrinal issues, too, doesn't always make you the most popular guy in the room when it comes to churchianity and religiosity. But I just want to be right with God and pleasing to Him. Amen? And that's what we all not need to be. Amen? And that's why this fellowship attracts people that love truth, that are sincere, uh, and it's, a, and it's a beautiful fellowship. 
And we've got, by the grace of God, tens of thousands of people that are associated with our ministry that just love what we're doing because they have hearts for truth. They love, they love truth, you know. It's really exciting because uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against Jesus' church. And it's exciting. But, you know, in biblical times, if you didn't have a funeral, it was considered a travesty. It was considered like a judgment, like not being honored. We read in Jeremiah chapter 16, verses 5 through 7, For thus says the Lord, Do not enter a house of mourning or go to lament or to console them, for I have withdrawn my peace from this people, declares the Lord. My loving kindness and compassion, both great men and small, will die in this land. They will not be buried. They will not be lamented. Nor will anyone gash or shave his head for them, which was a custom of lament or mourning those who had died. Uh, men will not break bread in mourning for them to comfort anyone for the dead, nor give them a cup of consolation to drink for anyone's father or mother who has died. So it was like a judgment if there were, wasn't a funeral for somebody. In fact, the Jews considered it so important that people's deaths were mourned. And it really is important uh, when, you know, someone dies to show respect, you know. But uh, to the point where in Jesus' time, you have people that would just be wailing, crying, bawling so hard, which is, can happen, at, it should happen at funerals in a lot of cases, especially if the person doesn't know Jesus, you know. Otherwise, if they know Jesus, you should be happy for them, but you're going to be mourning because you're going to miss them, and that's perfectly appropriate. But it says we don't grieve like the world grieves. Amen? But uh, they were professional mourners. At one time, it's like everybody's bawling and something, and everybody's fine. Like, what happened? Well, a lot of these people were paid money. They're professional mourners to go and wail for people, you know? And uh, crazy, huh? But here we see that this guy is living a hip. He sees Solomon saying this is futile. There's people living wicked lives going in and out of the temple, probably ripping off people in the temple, probably there just uh, as a, a, for business or whatever, looking at people as prey at, at, and then pretending to be religious. And then their funeral, they return to the scene of the crimes <laughs> yeah, they committed, and they're being praised. And Solomon's saying people are just blinded to the reality that there's a bigger picture. And he's seen through the futility of it all and calls it, uh, futility. Now, they're going to the temple as though that, going in and out of the temple as though that makes you holy. You know, we always say going to church is not what makes you a Christian. Any, any, amen? Going to a, we talk about how going to an auto shop doesn't make you a, a car, you know. <laughs> going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Going to the donut shop does not make you a police officer, you know. <laughs> Just those guys work the late shift, so they got to have a little bit of break there, you know. I, I, if I was making donuts, I'd be really thankful that cops were coming in at night. Amen. Well, stealing donuts, not so much. So uh, it's interesting, though, because going to church does not make you a believer, and that's what you need to get across to you. you apply, there's a lot we can apply here. You see, in the Old Testament times, in the book of Jeremiah, we see in Jeremiah that the people had a facade. They were whitewashed tombs as well. It talks about how, you know, uh, they were whitewashed. It doesn't use the word tombs, but, and inwardly, they didn't have a walk with God, so many of them. But they would say, they had a saying, and they'd steal each other's sayings, it says. And they'd say, the temple, the temple. they just talk all about the temple, the temple, you know? And as though being into the temple made them holy because they were associating with something holy. But it's about the heart. And as we're going to see in the text before us, there's something wrong with the heart. And you need to tell your children it's not about just going to church. It's about your heart being right with God. It's about knowing and following Jesus. Amen? And Jesus, even before he died, not long before he died, days, I mean, a couple days, when he gave the Olivet Discourse, remember that? And talked about how many would fall away and all the horrific things that would happen. Kingdom against kingdom, all these things. It says the, that discussion was precipitated by a comment of the disciples about the temple. And if you read Mark 13 with Luke 21 and Matthew 24, you'll see in Mark it says they were talking about the, you know, like there's these votive gifts put before the temple. And they were talking about how beautiful the temple was. And Jesus says that not one stone will be standing on this temple. And praise God. They had a beautiful temple, you know, rebuilt, 
awesome. He's going to be in the more beautiful temple, conditionally. It's a conditional promise in Ezekiel. Uh, and right now, praise God, there's some, you know, our church is way over, our church building is way overdue. But we're the church, amen? amen. And there's good things happening. But God wants to make us sure that, make sure that we're more concerned about what our hearts look like before God than what the paint job of the church looks like. Although it looks awesome, praise God. You know, that's not my commentary. It's a great paint job. But we've got to be doing that in here. Amen? God, clean my heart. Make it clean before you. Only you can make it righteous. I want to, tell, I want to be righteous. I want to be right before you. That's my heart. But we don't have power in ourselves. The Bible says uh, uh, the leper doesn't have the power to change its spots. Amen? And neither are those who are accustomed to doing evil. Do they have the power to make themselves righteous? That's why we have to say, hey, in my heart, I want to be righteous, God, but only you can affect righteousness, amen? And we need to teach our children. We need to teach our children, and we need to make sure ourselves that God is, examines the heart. He doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks at the what? On the heart. And he looks at our hearts, and we need to make sure that our hearts are right with God, amen? That we're forgiven through faith in Christ. And that we rely on the power of his Holy Spirit to become more and more holy, to become more and more like Jesus. So yes, talk to your children about the importance of going to fellowship, being in fellowship. Because if your heart's right, you're going to want to be in church. The Bible says, warns us, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, getting together, church, with the brothers and sisters. But gather together all the more, encouraging one another as you see the day of Christ getting closer. Amen. So we're supposed to be gathering together. And it's not just about learning, and certainly we learn. If you go to this fellowship, you're going to learn. But it's also not about just learning. It's about building up other people in the fellowship, being there, because we're all ministers of reconciliation, encouraging each other. So when you come to fellowship, one of your prayers should be, Lord, help me, my heart to be right, and help me to receive and grow and know your truth and love you more. But the other part of that prayer should be also, Lord, please use me to be an encouragement to others, to encourage other people, to say some words that can put their eyes on Jesus, you know. And people need encouragement these days, amen? So church should be something that you're excited about because you get to grow, you get to know, you get to praise God and worship Him, uh, you get to learn His Word, but it also should be exciting for you because you get to go and encourage other people. And you get to go and make a difference in the lives of other people. And that's huge. God cares so much about what you say to other people, it's a, it has, can have huge effects in their lives. And you need to realize, the Bible emphasizes, that in the tongue there's the power of life and death. Amen? It's not like the word faith, you know, the false prosperity gospel teaches that you have magical words that can construct new universes or whatever. It's little gods. But you do have, but your words are important to encourage people in their faith in Christ. Amen? And they, there's the power of life and death. In God's word, is, his word is life. Amen? He has the words of life. We speak them into the lives of other people to encourage them in God's truth. So let's build up the true temple of God, which is we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And we minister and encourage one another. And that's, that's an important, important deal. Now, verse 11. Verse 11. Because the sentence, now this is interesting, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, Therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Catch what he's saying there? This is a very interesting verse. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. In other words, since judgment, bam, doesn't come immediately, and the wicked think they're getting away with things, wow! then their hearts, hearts get full with evil. Think of the shooter. The guy that, in Florida that just, what, you're like, what shooter? There's so many of them these days, right? Well, the guy in Florida, you know, that killed, what, 17 people? How many times was he warned without any judgment coming upon him? How many times was he interviewed? They had this guy on their watch list, and several people warned about him, talked about him. He was even... Even, even the people in the school officials said this guy should be institutionalized. And the FBI did little or nothing about it. And before you know it, there's hundreds of people in different families grieving the loss of loved ones. 
many injured too. Uh, they say, well, you know, the Bible says, if you shed a man's blood, your blood should be shed too. Genesis 9, that's before the law of Moses. And in, he, and in Romans 13, it says that, uh, you know, those who, you know, governing officials, they don't carry the sword in vain. It's ordained by God. That has to do with capital punishment. Yet they say statistics show in, in a lot of ways that capital punishment does not deter crime. But, when, but in some places it does. You know when it doesn't? When somebody is allowed to grow old on death row, it doesn't kill, get, get, get executed for 40, 50 years. When you have a Charles Manson who never sees it, you know, the laws change back and forth in California on, on the death penalty. And uh, so it sends a message where even if I get the death penalty, I'll get out of this, you know. And it encourages people that there's no consequences to crime. On the other hand, God delays judgment. God delays judgment. Why does he delay judgment? Mercy. And when people don't see God's judgment, they think, oh, I'm getting away with it. Same thing. I'm glad, though, God delays judgment. I'm glad that he shows great mercies. I'm happy, thank you, Jesus, that his mercies are new every morning. Amen? Because if they weren't, I know I'd be in big trouble. Big Jim has to go through his records from when he was a young guy because uh, there's a gal he's fallen in love with in the Philippines. Uh, Jim's foot, six foot six, she's three foot one. So it's going to be a very interesting relationship, you know. No, she's taller than that. I'm, I'm messing with Jimmy. <laughs> we, we joke about the size difference. But a uh, beautiful gal, and he's in love with her. She's in love with him. And, and to get her over here, he has to go through these checks, background checks. Who is he? Who is she? He's having a hard time getting his records. And Jim was arrested 15 times or so. You know, can't remember it all because it says if you don't write down everything you did and then it, something pops up that you didn't write down, you're in big trouble, basically. Jim's like, I can't remember everything I did, you know. I said, maybe you just need to start putting things down like I tortured puppies, like anything that could pop up, you know. You know, but I was teasing. I said, don't do that. I, I said, I go, look for an immigration officer, you know. Try to, try to find out, uh, you know, what you can do here. And he's in better shape today, but pray, pray for that whole process for Jimmy. Amen? It's exciting. Uh, he never tortured puppies, just your typical boneheaded stuff that a lot of us did as young people. And many of us didn't go to prison or jail. And we look, we point a finger at other people. Oh, this should happen to this person. And there's three pointing back. Because the Bible says we're all guilty of sin. You may not have committed a crime that you could be arrested for in this country, but guess what? All have sinned and committed crimes against the bar of heaven. Amen? And we all deserve death. Amen. Amen. And thankfully, God was merciful. and He became a man and was executed on the cross and said it is finished because he paid in full for all of our crimes. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we praise God for his mercy. But there's a quandary, so to speak, because because of his mercy, he allows time for repentance. People looked at it as a message as a message as though, oh, I guess there's no consequences. Then they look at Hollywood and they see, wow, there's no consequences to all these, you know, there's always... All the bad guys seem to always get away with it in Hollywood. You know, they look at Washington and they say, wow, they get away with it. Republicans and Democrats often get away with a lot of these things. You know, this guy gets busted and this gal goes to prison, but Hillary gets off and, and even members of the FBI lie, you know, and wow. So kids are being sent these colossal messages that there's no consequences. They play these video games, and over and over again, they get shot, but they get to live another day, you know? And collectively, collectively, especially if your mind's impressionable and you don't think things through and you only look at under the sun, you could fall into the illusion that you can get away with evil. And that's what's happening in our country in mass right now. And it's getting worse and worse, especially since we have sought to erase God from the consciousness of students in the government schools, in the public square, 
and now in academia and entertainment and what would we expect that would happen? But there, there would be mass bloodshed and people not treating other people as, with respect as though they were created in the image of God. They're not being taught that they're created in the image of God. That's why. Being taught that they're just a bunch of animals who have no true, intrinsic, objective, transcendent value or meaning. The big problem here. Verse 11, because a sentence against an evil deed. By the way, it's funny. Uh, I didn't mention this to you, Chris. Where's Chris Knighton? Are you here today, brother? Praise the Lord. But he was mentioning last night about how sometimes Hebrew language has some Persian words in it, you know? Uh, and it's so funny, Chris, because that word right there, I didn't say this to you, but that word uh, sentence right there is a Persian word, pitgam, P-I-T-G-A-M. And it says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. And as our nation becomes more and more liberal, and as the prisons become more and more full, and as people get out earlier, and as uh, they don't go in, many don't go in, and then with, and others think, well, I'm not that bad when you're, they're sinners before God because we all need grace. It's just going to mushroom. It's going to get uglier and uglier. And that's what Jesus said, let lawlessness will increase. Amen? He said, the love of many will grow cold. Paul said, evil men will get worse and worse, will wax worse and worse, and, go, and proceed from bad to evil, he says. The difficult times will come, and men will be lovers of self, all that stuff. And all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it's in the context of the world's love growing cold and lawlessness increasing, that persecution will increase upon the believer if you put those scriptures together. And we're already seeing it. There's be, because it says there'll be haters of the good. Amen? So, because why? Why, will, why do they hate Jesus? Jesus was perfect, guys. Amen? He only did good. Perfect love. Perfect truth. And the more you're like Jesus, the more the wicked are not going to want you to remind them of your very, your very presence and seeking to do what's right. Puts them in danger of having their consciences resurrected to where they have to admit that they're doing wrong. It's easier to expunge the conscience for many than to get the heart right with God. Amen? It's important to understand. Now, God does show kindness. He is patient. He doesn't bring judgment immediately. I mean, when you reach the age of accountability, whatever age that was, 8, 9, 10, 7, 11, I don't know, whatever the age was for you, and the moment you fell short of God's glory and you were accountable before God and he wiped you out, that would be a bummer. But thankful he was patient and his Holy Spirit drew you to himself. Amen? And he revealed the gospel. He revealed Jesus to you so you could be saved. Amen? Now, God is definitely merciful. He says in Hosea, my heart turns over within me. I long to show you mercy. He wants to show us mercy. That's an awesome God. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. It says, therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. And therefore, he wants to, uh, he wants, uh, he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. So he waits. He, he waits on high to have compassion on you. That's a beautiful verse. But, and, but, and I'll, but the Bible also says in Romans chapter 2 that he's, he says it's his kindness that leads you to what? Repentance. So his kindness also, where some people take advantage of it, amen? Oh, I'm getting away with this and they'll do more. Other people say, wow, man, I deserve to be judged by God. I deserve to be slain and separated from him forever. But guess what happens, man? Their hearts just break before God. And they're like, man, I'm a sinner. I deserve death. Have mercy on me, God. I'm a sinner. And those who are forgiven much, what? Love much, amen? We love him because he first, what? Loved us. Because the mercies of God says, therefore, offer up your bodies as living sacrifices. Amen? We need to understand that. We need to apply that to our lives. When we're struggling on our walk, when we think we're losing our fire, we need to recognize how good God has been to us. Amen? We remind ourselves of his kindness and his great love and that that should, that should spurn us on to repentance, deeper repentance if we're already walking with him. Amen? And a greater love for him. Amen? Teach your children about the love of God and how awesome his love is so they'd be motivated but also let them know he is a God of judgment. 
Because we read in this verse before us, because the sentence against an evil deed, notice the word sentence, there is still a sentence. It's all about the timing. Do you understand? We need to let people know there is a sentence that is coming. The Bible says, point a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Okay? So there is a sentence. It's just delayed because God loves us. And they see the sentence takes some time because it's not executed quickly. Now go to 2 Peter. Go to 2 Peter. Peter deals with this. 2 Peter. Chapter 3. This is now, beloved, he writes in verse 1, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. God reminds us over and over again that you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by your apostles. Know this first of all, that in the last days mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lust and saying, what are they going to be saying? Where is the uh, promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all what? All continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. What's he saying there? Remember how the last time we were in Ecclesiastes, it was mirrored by Romans chapter 13 on obedience to the governing authorities, right? Well, this passage that we're now in Ecclesiastes right after that is mirrored right here in 2 Peter 3. Because the sons of men run to do evil because judgment is not executed quickly. They're not seeing God's judgment. They're like, ah. And he says right here in verse 4, they're saying what? Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all what? Continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Oh, look, everything day by day goes by. God hasn't intervened yet. We're getting away with it. And they're called mockers. Now these mockers miss something very important. Look at verse 5. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was what? Destroyed, being flooded with water. He's saying, hey, they're ignoring that God intervened even on a worldwide level and destroyed the the planet, all life pretty much on the planet except that little bit of life he preserved to start over with, humanity and the animal kingdom. They're ignoring God's cataclysmic ju judgment. See, the world gets stuck, and Satan loves this, in the idea of uniformitarianism. The uniformitarianism, the idea is that everything just kind of stays the same. doesn't really change. And the Bible teaches uh, catastrophism takes place. Contrary to the idea of uniformism that everything just stays the same, there is catastrophism, boom, where God does intervene. Now, God showed mercy and was long-suffering. Peter says in his first epistle, in chapter 3, he talks about the long-suffering and the preaching of Noah. Amen? The scriptures say that God waited 120 years before he flooded them, warning them. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but they weren't repenting. God throughout, I mean, he gave the Canaanites... 400 years before they filled up the measure of their wickedness and God brought the Jews into the promised land to execute judgment. He's merciful. And he say, Peter's saying, hey, they're ignorant of this. King James, woefully ignorant. They're ignorant of the fact that God has already intervened in the past and guess what's going to happen in the future? Verse 7. But, his word, uh, by, but by his word, the present heavens are, and earth are what? Reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. They're ignorant of the fact that God has already judged the entire world. Now, he's made a lot of judgments se se uh, subsequent to that uh, that are more localized, whether it's Sodom and Gomorrah going up in smoke, or whether it's individually in each person's life, with, whether it's discipline or judgment. We just look at sec looked at sexually transmitted diseases and how they're on the increase, and God warns that, that those would be his judgments in the end times. Now, it's interesting. These are mockers, though. These are these that are mocking his coming. Oh, waiting for that guy is like waiting for the second coming. You know, that's it was embedded in the jokes. It's actually a fulfillment. When people joke like that, they're actually fulfilling Scripture, which says that people would mock him in the end times about his coming. Isn't that crazy? 
In fact, guess what? I was asked by a Christian news network to do a, uh, to, you know, write some things about a new series that just came out. Uh, came out just at the end of last month, end of February. And it's called Living Biblically. And they just wanted my take on it, you know. And I needed an article for a, a Christian post that I was getting ready to write or just had written. I thought, I'll, I'll work on this. And uh, look at this show. Anybody see it? Wait a minute, all these Christians here? And you're not watching Living Biblically? Good for you. Must be a lot of smart Christians here. Because I said the show in the title... Uh, I, I said that, you know, it should be called Mocking Blasphemously. Because it centered around a character named Chip, who is a lapsed Catholic who wants to get right. He's a journalist for a Chicago newspaper, and he wants to get right with God, and he wants to live according to the book, live biblically. So he seeks out a rabbi, and he seeks out a priest, and they spend most of their time in the bar. I know it sounds like a joke, right? Priest and a rabbi, and a uh, lapsed Catholic going to a bar. And then the whole show basically makes a joke of following God's word. And most of it takes, takes place, well, a lot of it takes place while they're drinking together in a bar. Not bringing the lost to Christ. And the show is atrocious, really. Uh, and I haven't watched the full episode, I admit, but I've read some of the storylines. I've looked at the promo. I, 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 read, I, I looked at some of the, because uh, I'm not going to take my time and watch a bunch of episodes. I'm just going to get my take and say, okay, what's the truth about this show? And just in a promo, you know, he goes to his priest and he says, because he finds out his friend has committed adultery with, another, with a woman. And he's appalled because he knows it's wrong. And he goes to the priest and says, what do I do? The priest says, well, you know, the Bible says you're supposed to stone adulterers. You know, but, but you'll get arrested for it in this day and age, you know. And you know what? He proceeds to go into, I guess, a bar. It looks like a bar because the scene is on the promo. Has a nice-sized rock in his hand, a big rock. And just chucks it at it, hits him in the forehead, you know. And then the cheap laugh tracks roll, you know. Ah. I thought, well, this is the, you know, this is like, it's, it's almost, it's as though the writing is coming from the Internet trolls who try to take the Bible out of context and act like this is what, Christians are supposed to be doing. Most of you would be able to see through that right away. Wait a minute. Did God ever give Christians the command to stone adulterers? Yes or no? No, we know that right from the get-go. We're under the new covenant, amen? And when an adulterous woman was brought to Jesus, did he say, let's all stone her? No, he says, let him who is without what? Sin. Some translations, let him who has never sinned. Cast the first stone. Be the first one to throw a stone at her. Did any of them do it? No, that was the point. Because Jesus stooped on the ground and began writing. I believe he was writing their sins. There's only a couple times in Scripture you see God write. The commandments, amen? Judgment. And you see in uh, Daniel, right? The writing on the wall, judgment. And I believe he was writing the judgments they deserved. And one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, they left. He said, where are your accusers? They don't put that in the show. They don't show that faith comes, that salvation comes through faith in Christ. They don't, realize, they don't show that forgiveness of sins, like adultery and everything else, can be forgiven if someone truly repents from the heart and turns to Jesus. They don't show Jesus' words where he says, go and sin no more to her. Or another place where he warns someone, go and sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. Because there is judgment if you refuse to repent. We deserve it even before the chance of repentance, but God gives us mercy. Amen? So, I, if you want to see that, that should be up on the Christian News Network any day. Uh, and then maybe the full article in, in the Christian Post. But I'll tell you what, uh, it's actually ridiculous. It's a CBS uh, show, but it says here in the last days there'll be what? Mockers, right? And now you can see this being fulfilled on primetime television. Living biblically. And by the way, they're trying to draw Christians in. And I looked on YouTube at some of the comments, and they're, I'm a Christian, I love this show, I can't wait, this is a great. I'm like, oh Lord God, people are so unaware that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, that Satan's the God of this world, right? And it says eventually they're going to move, re, put other teachings from other religions in that he's going to try to obey. Go, oh, there it goes. 
Now the Christians that are like, oh, this is great, you know. And now all of a sudden Hinduism gets, you know, New Age teaching. Who knows? I don't know where it's going to go. But living biblically surely, surely should be called mocking blasphemously. And it says the last day that's going to happen. And here it says that they'll be saying, where is the promise of his coming? Everything continues the same. And that's exactly what Ecclesiastes is talking about. People are going to be saying, hey, they do evil because judgment isn't coming. And judgment is coming, folks. In fact, look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Continue reading now. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice what? That God judged the world with a flood. Then verse 7, he's going to judge it again with fire, right? But look at verse 8. This also escapes their notice. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like what? One day. In other words, under heaven, it seems like they're getting away with it. Amen? But a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to God. So it's what's like, man this, man, this has been going on for thousands of years. Man, 2,000 years since Jesus came, he hasn't come back. In God's perspective, how long is that? About two days. Two days. Because he's eternal. He's not affected by time. He's not growing a big gray beard and losing his hair. Okay, he's spirit. Amen? Spirit hath not flesh and blood. And God doesn't age. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? You got a nice beard, Jim. I saw you stroke it right after I said that. <laughs> not making you self-conscious, bro. It's a nice one. You're still young, too, relatively. <laughs> not relative to God. I mean relative to a lot of us. Okay. <laughs> but God is he's so amazing. He's an eternal God. And we put our trust in him. And then we look at verse 8. I love this. Don't let this one fact escape your notice, beloved. There's a perspective of time. You can't just look under the sun. And that's what Solomon keeps trying to do. He keeps trying to show us the secular viewpoint and then contrast it with God's viewpoint. And he lived in both. But look at verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise as some, now this is important, as some what? Count slowness. God does not do math the same way we do math. Okay? Two plus two is always four, but guess what? The way he sees time and the way we see time is different. We only know time by our experience, amen? God knows eternity. He is from everlasting to everlasting. He is not subjected and changed by time, amen? He's outside of time. He entered into our time-space continuum and became a man, the God-man, to pay for our sins. But for him, it's not like, oh, this is taking forever. No, he wants souls to be saved. And we have to put our trust in him. We have to put a trust in his plan. We have to put our trust in his timing. Amen? Amen. And that's when you talk to your young people, your children. You talk to them about trusting God. You talk to them about trusting his plan. He's got a plan for salvation. And because you have to explain evil. People, any halfway smart person, any average person is going to scratch their head and say, why does God allow evil? Why do people seem to get away with sins? And that should, that's going to play humanity, those questions. But God gives us the answers. Amen? And I love it. They're clear as day. That he's waiting. And he waits, it says. We just quote, I just quote Isaiah. He waits. He longs to show his mercy. Amen? And that's why we're called to wait on the Lord. Amen? Because sometimes, guess what? We want it now. We live in this, you know, this generation where it's instant gratification, man. We want a burrito? Pfft, stick it in the microwave, right? We want money? Pfft, go to the ATM. We want money we don't have? Use a credit card. Do it later. And it just, everything's right here. I mean, I'll tell you what, man. How many you praise God for Amazon? <laughs> My wife is like so bummed out I found Amazon a while back. You know? So, what's this? Sardines. Hey, you know? I'm teasing, baby. She just, she's like, she don't, don't spend a ton of money. She's trying to be wise, you know? I'm like, man, I get sardines at my front door with my kimchi, which I don't know if I can order that. I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> kimchi and sardines are two superfoods that are so good for you and, and yummy, too, if you get the right kimchi. But what's that? Oh, wow. Is that a laxative, bro? <laughs> he said wasabi almonds. You get those two. Uh, he's given me some. A couple bags now. Those are really, really good. Except they do act like a laxative. <laughs> he told me that. You know, no, just kidding. 
No, they're, they're really yummy. Thanks, bro. Those are really, really good. I'm just pacing myself because they're so good. And good protein. Wasabi almonds. I know they're really good. But uh, it's important for us to recognize that here he says, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is what? Is patient toward you, not wishing for any to what? Perish, but for all to come to repentance. I love what Peter does here. He brings judgment still because God is a just God. He's not going to let people just wickedly treat each other wicked and destroy the whole earth. Jesus said if, if, if the Son of Man didn't return when he's going to return, there would be no flesh saved on the earth. Everybody, be, all flesh would be destroyed. Amen? So God's not going to allow that to happen. He's going to come back. But in the meantime, he wants more people saved. Read verse 9 again. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God is not a Calvinist, guys. Okay? He doesn't wish that any perish. He wants all to come to repentance. And you know what any means in the Greek right there? Any. You know what all means in the Greek right there? All. all. You know? And the context is, just like in the days of Noah, when Noah was a preacher of righteousness to the wicked, giving opportunity for people to be saved that wouldn't be saved. You know? Jesus tasted death for everyone. Amen? Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the verdict is in. They love darkness more than light. That's the world that he loved and gave his son for. The, one that, the, the ones that continue to love darkness. So obviously the non-elect his son was given for. Amen? Amen. Given for the whole world. But he doesn't will that any would perish, but for all to come to what? Repentance. Repentance is, I've mentioned it several times in the past, because I really, because most Christians misunderstand it. Repentance is one side of a coin called conversion, faith and repentance. The Bible always puts repentance before faith. It's three or four times in the New Testament. You see the two coupled together in the same uh, text, in uh, the same verse, and it'll be repentance and faith, because repentance is turning from the road to destruction toward God. Faith is the toward. Repentance is the from. And sometimes it can be repentance toward God because when you're turning from, you're turning what? Toward. And that takes the confusion away. And it's having a change of heart to turn from a, your wicked ways to Jesus. It's a metanoia, change of heart, change of mind. And the fruit of repentance is doing good. Repentance isn't doing good in itself, but the fruit of repentance is now you're following Jesus. There's evidence that you are putting your trust in Jesus and he's doing a good work in your life by his grace. Amen? So he wants all to turn to repentance. And you can't have faith without, you can't have true, genuine faith without repentance because you can't be turning toward if you're not turning from. <laughs> Amen? Now, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its work will be what? Burned up. It's coming. Judgment is coming. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Brothers and sisters, he's saying apply this to your life. Since God is going to destroy the planet with fire, since he's going to come in fiery judgment to judge the wicked, those who refuse to repent, he says this, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? In other words, your conduct should be holy before God. Amen? You should be living a godly life. You should be seeking to become more and more like Jesus. Amen? Amen. Be holy as your God, Father in heaven is holy, Peter writes elsewhere. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. We're never going to be absolutely perfect until Jesus returns, but we're supposed to aspire to be perfect and be like him. Amen? Amen. And to grow day by day and become more and more Christ-like. And that's very, very important. I love it. Verse... Uh, 11, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. Wow. Since it's going to melt, there's, there, everything's going to burn, man. You might, well, you might make, make yourself right with Jesus, amen? amen? Put your faith in Christ. Get right with the Lord. It's very, very important. And by the way, did you notice that? Verse 12, looking for and what? Hastening. What does it mean to hasten something? It means to speed something up, right? Lisa, we got to go. Come on. I'm hastening her. Or, or no, she just flew the office. Come on, we're going to be late. She's hastening me. Well, guess what? How do we hasten? Jesus coming. 
Prayer is important. That's vital. What? Winning souls. Jesus said the gospel of the kingdom we preach in all the world as a witness to all nations. Then what will happen? Then the end will come. Paul writes in Romans 11, when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all the last Gentiles, the last people are saved, then the deliverer will come out of Zion. Woo, there it is again. He says, get off your rear end and start preaching the gospel, so to speak. Okay, that's just Joe Shimmel paraphrase, but that's what he's talking about there. Go and preach the gospel, man. Share the good news with the lost. And that's kind of, go back now to verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but it's patient toward who? You. I used to read that as you, meaning the lost, because he's not willing that any would perish, but all can repent. It talks about them in the last clause. But when you look at it in the context of we're supposed to hasten his coming, he's patient toward you, meaning the church, to get the job done. You get it? He's being patient with us. We're part of the problem of why things are taking so long, because He's commanded us to go, and we sit on our hands. Amen? Jesus said, and that's why prayer is part of it, pray that the, that the Father would send out labors in the harvest field because it's white in the snow. When the harvest gets white, when corn gets white, it's overdue. It, it's been ripe for a while. You need to get it on the job. Amen? So God, give us hearts to be witnesses. He's being patient toward us. Not one that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. Verse uh, 14 or verse 13, but according to his promise, we are looking for what? New heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. If God does not create a new heaven and a new earth, every scientist will admit that this, everything is going to, a, this, this universe is going to die a heat death, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. Everything's running down. The, all the energy in the, the universe will run down to zero. But thankfully, Jesus is going to intervene, Amen. And he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more death. There's no more entropy. Look at verse 14. Therefore, in light of this, guys, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. Therefore, there's an application again. Since you're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, since God's judgment is coming, what should we be doing? We should be diligent, serious about it, to be found in him in peace, spotless and what? And blameless. If Jesus returned, say we were in the tribulation period, and he returned, and this was the end of the tribulation period, would you be found in him spotless and blameless? Or is your heart in rebellion to God? Have you been cleansed of your sins? Are you trusting in the blood? Is Jesus first in your life let's go back to Ecclesiastes back to Ecclesiastes and uh, and when you get to Ecclesiastes go to chapter 8 again but go to verse 12 go to verse 12 chapter 8 verse 12 although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life Still I know that it will be well for those who what? Fear God and who fear him openly. That's interesting. Although the sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life. Now remember the context here, guys. We started in verse 20 where there's a wicked guy going in and out of the temple. But he's living hypocritically, not living for Jesus not living for the Lord in the Old Testament context. And then he dies, but he has this great burial. He's honored, and he's saying, this is wrong. And that's what happens today in churches all over the place when someone dies. Very difficult situation. And then in that context, he goes to verse 11. We see, because the sentence against evil, an evil deed, is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Since this guy seems to live a nice long life, has a nice funeral. It doesn't seem like there's any judgment in his life. Therefore, guess what? God, they don't see God's judgment coming necessarily. Uh, they, they, they don't see over the sun. They just see under the sun. They don't see the bigger perspective. Guess what happens? They get the wrong message. God's saying his kindness is supposed to lead them to repent. He's giving them time so they don't have to send them to hell. But they take it wrong. And they, oh, I'm getting away with this. And then 
Now, I went through those again so you read the context and understand the flow. Into verse 12 now. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times, see, he continues rebelling, and may lengthen his life, still, I know that it will be well for those who fear the Lord or fear God, who fear him openly. So, and he may extend, he may uh, extend his, and the word life isn't in the Hebrew. Some believe might, might extend and live a life of sin, not necessarily that his life is, that, is, is really long. Um, it's, it's hard to translate, and translators admit that. Uh, Hebrew scholars admit that. So he says, though, I know, and usually he says, I see, I have observed, I see, I observe. Here he says, I know. Propositional truth. He knows this to be a fact, that it will be well for those who what? It will be well for those who fear God and who fear him openly. What's the key? We need to fear God. We need to see above the sun. We need to see the bigger picture. Amen? We need to see that ultimately God's judgment will come. And now, uh, we need to understand this too. Is Solomon wrote more about fearing God than anybody else. Do you know that? Just read Proverbs. He takes the cake probably just Proverbs by itself, writing about the fear of God. That's where in chapter 1, one of his, his thesis is the fear of the Lord leads to knowledge. Amen? You know, but fools despise knowledge and so forth. And in chapter 9, he says the fear of the Lord is beginning to wisdom. And then here, just in Ecclesiastes, look at chapter 3. Look at what he's already said about it. Verse 14, he talks about this need for the fear of God. I know that everything God does will remain forever. Therefore, there is nothing, he says, I'm sorry, there is nothing to add to it, and there is nothing to take from it. I mean, he's got a perfect plan. For God has so worked that men should what? Fear him. Look at chapter 5, verse 3. Chapter 5, verse 3. We read, For the dream comes through much effort, and the voice of a fool through many words. Verse 5. It is better that you should not vow than that you should vow and not pay. Now, uh, verse 6, do not let your speech cause you to sin. They do not say, uh, say in the presence of a messenger of God that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry on account of your voice and destroy the work of your hands? Verse 7, for in many dreams and in many words there is emptiness. Rather what? Fear God. Look at chapter 7, verse 18. It is good that you grasp one thing and also let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. And I don't have time to get in the context of those we've already studied these through. But over and over again, and now here it, here's the fear of God again in chapter 8. The conclusion of his letter is summarized in part with fearing God. Look at verse chapter 12 at the very end of uh, his writing. Verse 13. The conclusion, when all has been heard, is this. Is fear God and keep his what? Fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. Don't think it doesn't apply to you. You better be fearing God. Don't think, oh, that person should fear God. No, you need to fear God and obey his commandments. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to what? To judgment. Everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. God's going to all stand before the judgment bar of God. So now go back with that, armed with what Solomon's been saying about with fear, the fear of God, just in Ecclesiastes. We haven't looked at everything in the fear of God in Ecclesiastes because we're going to study it more as we move on. But it's interesting here, he makes it really clear that it will be well. Look at this. It will be well for those who fear God, who fear him openly. Some translate that in his presence. Brothers and sisters, do you want your life to go well? Do you want it to end well? Or even if you don't have a funeral, it ends well because you're, in, you're before God in eternity and you've accepted the judgment that fell upon Christ on your behalf. Amen? Fear God then. Do you want it to go well for your children? Don't just teach them about the love of God, which I emphasized earlier in this message. Teach them about the fear of God. Teach them how holy and righteous and pure he is. Amen? That he is a God of mercy. Yes, we should love him for that but also a God of judgment, and we should love him for his righteousness too. Amen? We need to teach our children the fear of God, but it needs to start with us. We need to fear God, recognize who he is, how awesome uh, he is. And I, t I taught my children from a young age to fear God, and I believe it had a 
Huge effect. Where are you going, Josiah? Messing with you, buddy. <laughs> That's what I brought you up. All of their lives, you know. He's smiling back there. New glasses, they look good, buddy. Is he, it, I taught them the fear of God because I wanted them to know who he is. And, and by teaching the fear of God, you know how you teach them the fear of God? Teach them the scripture. Because they see his wonderful works, his mighty acts, his acts of judgment, his holy nature, how he's powerful and pure, and how he's going to judge the earth. And they recognize, wow, this is serious from a young age. And things go well with them when they receive. Not every ch child's going to receive that teaching. Check out Jojo. Just fled right when I brought it up, man. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. He's a very godly young man. But uh, we need to fear God. And this is missing in the body of Christ. It's one of the most important things that's missing in the church today is the fear of God. Well, that's for the Old Testament. Are you kidding? It says the fear of the Lord is everlasting. Paul said, you know, let's perfect holiness in the fear of God, the apostle of grace. When the everlasting gospel is preached in Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, the angel says, fear God. One of the things he says. And the world's gone amok and awry because people fail to fear God. It's in teaching God's holy nature and character from the scripture and who he is that entails fear in our hearts if we receive his word. Listen to Job 37, verses 22 through 24. Out of the north comes golden splendor. Around God is awesome majesty. The Almighty, he can, uh, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Therefore, therefore what? Because he's righteous, because he's awesome in majesty, because he's exalted in power, because he's almighty, all those wonderful things it says. Therefore, men, therefore, men, fear him. Therefore, men, fear him. He does not regard any who are wise of heart. I mean, if you're wise in your own heart, I don't need to fear God. He doesn't regard you. You're in big trouble. He regards those who fear him. And it says who fear him openly in Ecclesiastes. And I said that can be translated in his presence. Think of the holy seraphim, angels that are created much more powerful than us, are before God. With two wings they fly, with two they cover their feet, with two they cover their face, and they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they're way more powerful than us, but they're like, whoa, he's radical. We ought to be praising him for his holiness, for his power, for his sovereignty, for his, his holy and righteous rule, his almighty awesomeness. Amen? We ought to be praising him that way for that, because of that. After the author of Hebrews talks about God's power and how he's going to shake the heavens and the earth, he goes on to say, verse 28, therefore, since we receive a kingdom, therefore, there's a therefore again, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with fear or reverence and awe. For God, our God, is a consuming fire. You teach your children, man, that God is love, but he's also consuming fire and he's going to bring judgment. So they have a right understanding of God. Because if you don't exalt and honor God, and you're not conscientious of the reality of who he is, and his great love and his great power, and the fact that he's going to judge, you'll have a minimalist view of sin. And you won't treat your behavior as though it's important. And if you don't put faith in God, his plan, and his timing, and you don't think judgment is coming, you're not, you're not going to be motivated to get right with God. Amen? Let's go back now to Ecclesiastes 8. Look at verse 13. But it will not be well for the evil man. He will not lengthen his days like a what? Shadow. Because he does not fear what? God. He lets us know that that wicked man, his days may have been lengthened on the earth in people's eyes, but they're very short, right? We've read in Peter, a thousand years like a day, a day is like a thousand years. In God's eyes, they're very short. And his life is maybe like a shadow. Now here it says, it's interesting in the text, it says, but it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow. That could be translated, even though his days are like a shadow, okay? Or, or even though his days are lengthened like a shadow. 
In other words, in the human perspective, under the sun, his, 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 his days are lengthened like a shadow. And I think that's the better translation because you see throughout the Old Testament this paradigm of Scripture where God uses the length of a shadow as uh, the length of a man's life in contrast to God's eternity. In fact, we read here uh, in Psalm 102, verse 11, My days are like a lengthened shadow, and I will wither away like grass. But you, O Lord, abide forever. See how the lengthened shadow is contrasted with forever? And in your name for all generations. I am passing like a shadow when it lengthens. Psalm 109, verse 23. I am shaken off like a locust. So it's interesting. And then there's Psalm 49 and, and Psalm 73, where the wicked man's life is temporal and comp compared to not God now, but compared to God and his eternity and the, the, the length of the life of the believer. For instance, Psalm 49, 12 through 15 says, But man in his pomp will not endure. He is like a beast that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and those who after them approve their words. As sheep they are pointed to Sheol, Hades, judgment. Death shall be their shepherd and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. In the resurrection, I believe he's referring to there. And their form shall be for Sheol to consume, so that they have no habitation. But God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol. Uh, he will receive me. And Psalm 73, how could we forget these beautiful words? Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. How they are destroyed in a moment. They are utterly swept away by sudden terrors. And a few verses later, verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. Amen? With your counsel you guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Who have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Uh, for behold, those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of my God, I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your works. So, brothers and sisters, God looks at man, the wicked, their lives are like a long shadow. But what happens? What makes a long shadow? The setting sun. The setting sun. And the sun someday will be set to where it'll just be night. And it'll be an eternal night. And it says of mockers in the book of Jude that the black, they'll ha have the blackest of darkness forever. It's heavy. The blackest of darkness. Can you imagine that? Forever. And for the believer, though, the son of righteousness, S-U-N, he's called too. The day star will rise in our hearts at his coming, amen. And he'll shine like the sun and noonday. There'll be no shadows, so to speak. And the day that gets brighter and brighter, we look forward to that day. And uh, we look forward to God's return, Lord's return, Amen. You know, did you guys see what happened? It was reported yesterday because I think it happened Friday in France. Friday, uh, our Saturday morning maybe, is the French uh, police officer, lieutenant colonel actually. See what he did? He gave his life to free a hostage. Anybody see that story? It was awesome. Only a few hands saw that. It was an amazing story. Uh, was, uh, last, just a couple days ago, a French police officer heroically, he heroically gave himself and swapped himself for a hostage. And there was a, a crazy, you know, uh, crazed uh, Muslim militant yelling, Allahu Akbar, and he was on the watch, watch list. They knew that this guy was a potential, and boom, he shot into a, a group of police officers who were jogging, you know. Uh, he killed a couple other people. He took others hostage. By the time it was over, there's four dead, 15 wounded, last time I read the story. And uh, it's interesting because Lieutenant Colonel uh, Arnaud Beltrami, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, B-E-L-T-R-A-M-E, -E, 44, uh, swapped himself for a hostage and was killed. And the French president, Emmanuel Mar 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 Marcron, said in a statement that uh, Batrami, quote, showed exceptional courage. And in giving his life to the end, that to end the deadly plan of jihad, this jihad terrorist, he fell as a hero. Uh, his brother, Cedric, said of his brother who gave himself, he says, he gave his life for strangers. He must have known that he didn't really have a chance. If that doesn't make him a hero, I don't know what would. And there's a lot of cowards today. We're seeing that 
people shooting unarmed people at schools, all kinds of cowards out there today. It's nice to see people step up heroically. Amen? And who does that remind you of? Who does that guy remind you of a little bit? Jesus, the ultimate hero. It says of Jesus in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though a good person someone might possibly dare to die for. But God demonstrates his own love for us, in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And he says in that same text, different place, while we were God's enemies. He didn't just die for strangers. That would be pretty awesome. He died for us while we were his enemies. Amen? We were the ones going astray. We were the ones taking advantage of every new day and his mercy and not repenting and continuing to live for ourselves as though we were God and making up our own rules and breaking the law of love. Amen? And he says it's his kindness that leads to repentance, but he says, but people respond to that by treasuring up wickedness or wrath, I should say. They harden their hearts and their stubbornness. They don't repent. And they treasure up wrath for themselves. So before we got saved, every day we continued to sin, we treasured up more and more wrath and judgment that would befall us. Do you understand that? We were in dire straits because guess what? Our rap sheet got longer and longer every day, man. And the sentence of hell, and there's degrees of punishment in hell, the Bible teaches us, was getting darker and darker, more and more painful, more and more ugly. It all ugly. You enter the gates of hell, it's ugly, period. But it gets uglier. But praise God, at the right time, God became a man, amen? And he was mocked on the cross and died for the sins of the very ones mocking him, amen? What a wonderful Savior we have, amen? And the good news is that if we embrace Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can be forgiven of that long wrap sheet that we all have, amen? It could be nailed to the cross. Because Jesus on the cross said what? Remember what he said? What did he yell out in Greek? To tell us that it is what? It is finished. He paid in full, man. He paid all of our fine that we all deserve. And the, the good news is this. We don't have to stand before God paying for our own sins, which we deserve to pay for forever. We can accept what Jesus did on the cross, amen, and pass from death to life, amen? amen. So if you have not been saved right now, man, don't get, don't, I mean, can you imagine before going to prison, you're offered an opportunity of a full pardon and then rejecting it? Well, this is the worst prison sentence anyone could ever get. It's eternal hell separated from God. No escape for eternity. And the pardon's being offered you in this life. Don't take God's grace and mercy and not send you to hell yet as a license to mean that you can continue to rebel. Because judgment's coming. It's when a man wants to die, the Bible says, but after this, the judgment. Amen? So you need to take the pardon right now. You need to say, God, have mercy on me. I thank you that you have me here today. I ha that, that I'm hearing this message and that I can be pardoned, I can be forgiven before I die. You don't know when you're dying because guess what? That shadow is lengthened, but then, boom, the sun sets. And this could be your sunset today. You want to make sure that's a sunrise in your heart, amen? And that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, amen? amen. So if you don't know Jesus, today is the day, the Bible says, of salvation. Now it says the acceptable time. Turn to him right now and ask him for forgiveness. He already paid the price. He's only asking you, not willing that you, any should what? Perish, but that all should what? Repent. He wants you to repent and put your faith in Jesus and you'll pass from death to life and have eternal life. Amen? Amen? Is there a better deal to be had on earth? No. Don't pass it up, man. Otherwise, the Bible says there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll be so bummed out you rejected your pardon when you go into eternity. Don't let that happen. Embrace Jesus Christ right now as your Lord and Savior. Begin following him. Amen? We have such an awesome God. Let's all stand as they pass out communion. Praise God for his goodness. He is awesome. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We glorify your holy name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. All right. We have an awesome God. And I encourage you guys to apply this to your lives. How do you apply it to your lives? We talked a lot about it. But as they pass the cup and the communion out, I want to reinforce it. Trust God. When you go through hard times, there's things you don't understand. When you feel like you're sick with ailments, you're like, why am I so sick? And there's a wicked person over there just doing great. Trust God. Trust his plan. Trust his timing. Amen. God's waiting. He wants us to wait with him. Amen. He's always good. And then also thank God that you're not getting what you deserve. Amen. Jesus got what you deserved. Amen. You get grace. You get mercy. You get life. Amen. Fear God. 
Fear God so it will go well with you. Recognize that he is coming and he's a consuming fire. Amen. And he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And only those things that are founded on the rock of Jesus are going to stand. Everything else is sinking sand. Amen? Amen. And also, let's get off our rear end and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's not live our lives for ourselves. Let's live for Jesus. The Bible says, don't just look at your own interests. Look at the interests of others. Well, guess what? We're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen? I'm not going to hell anymore, but my neighbors are. Amen? And I would want my neighbor to warn me if I was headed toward the eternal fire. Amen? We need to warn them. And let them understand and share with them the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So this applies to our lives by getting involved in sharing the good news of Jesus. Amen? And being all about our Father's business. Praise God. He is good. Jack was emphasizing one of the things he emphasized yesterday at the Passover Seder was the importance of examining how there would be a time of examination of, you know, our deliverance and everything else. And uh, he brought the scripture in 1 Corinthians 11 where Paul tells us to examine ourselves. Amen? And so here we are in, at a time of year when millions of people are celebrating different holidays, but hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of Jews, celebrating Passover service, but not seeing Jesus in the Passover. And what we do is an abbreviated form of the Passover service every Sunday morning, pretty much. Uh, we take that bread, which was the middle portion, right, of that afikomen, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those three pieces of bread represent, in the Jewish Passover, that middle one's taken out, right? Bruised and striped, pierced, amen? And we take it out. And Jesus said of this piece, this is my body. And why do he say this is my body? Because it pictured his body all along for 1,500 years before Jesus, 3,500 years ago is when Moses led them out of the promise, out of, into the promised land. And there they had the first Passover. And for a th couple thousand years at least, they've been pulling that middle piece out, wrapping it in swaddling cloth, the Jews, to this day, that don't know Jesus, and burying it. Just as Jesus is the second person out of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the second was taken out and was wrapped after he died and was buried. And then they get that great reward, right? He took that piece, broke it, and said, this is my what? This is my body. It's a picture of him coming from heaven, dying for us. He says, take this in remembrance of me. What he did for us, amen? Let's partake of it in, in remembrance of Jesus. Father God, we thank you for the bread, which represents your son's holy body that was broken for us in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the cup. The cup of redemption. Jesus, Jesus has it, uh, Paul calls it the cup of thanksgiving. It's also a cup of thanksgiving. We give you thanks for our redemption. And we partake of it with great thanksgiving that Jesus shed his blood and we could take this remembrance of his sacrifice for us. Greater love than anyone's ever shown. Giving himself for, as a ransom for everyone who's been taken captive so we could all be set free. We partake of the cup with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, the Resur Resurrection Sunday is coming up. I want to encourage you right now. Listen. Resurrection, we have two services. We have a Sunday morning service at sunset at a park, which will be different than the regular service. I'm sorry. What's that? Sunrise. No, no. You guys, did you hear the message, the shadow and all that stuff? Yeah, sunrise. You're right. <laughs> sunrise. I said sunset. No, you don't want to be there at sunset. You'll be a little late. Uh, thank you. Sunrise service. Uh, and please be there because if you can make it great, it's going to be a short service, short teaching, different teaching than Sunday morning at 930, which will go until sunset. No, it won't. It'll be a regular service, you know. Uh, but so if you can make both, that would be great. But at least make one, amen? And, have a, and by the way, Wednesday night is Bible study. We have a great time here. Guess what we'll be looking at? Jesus on the cross, his death before the resurrection message. So if you can make Wednesday night, man, make it. We're going to do a topical message on his death. Are you guys so happy that God is merciful and he didn't bring judgment before you got saved? Give him thanks and praise. Amen. We thank you, Lord. We praise your name. You are so worthy to be praised, Lord God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, you guys. Hey, have a beautiful Lord's Day. Give somebody a big hug. God bless you guys. Praise God for you guys.